Thank you for joining us for the final session of the Alt Dev Student Summit. We are very pleased to introduce our closing keynote speaker, who is Jen McLean. Her session is called From Playtester to CEO. Uh, if you have any questions for Jen, uh, you can ask them in the link below the video you're watching just now. Uh, and you can join in the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag hash altdevconf, uh, which you can see in the top right of this screen just now. Um, so without any further interruption, I'd like to turn it over to Jen uh, for her keynote. Thanks so much, Luke. First of all, thank you everyone who is listening to this. I, I really appreciate you taking time out of your life to hear some of my stories from 20 years in game development. Um, I hope that you will find this entertaining and instructive, and I hope you'll take away at least uh, one, of, one nugget of something that inspires you. They say that experience is the best teacher, but also the most painful teacher. And in 20 years of game development, I've had a lot of experience, and a lot of it has been painful. Uh, a lot of it's been amazing as well. And if you can walk away from the next 45 minutes or so um, with the benefit of some of that experience, then I know I will at least consider this time well spent. So thank you. Now, when people meet me, they're often surprised when I talk about 20 years in games. Uh, full disclosure, I will turn 40 in a week and a half, which means I got started in games when I was still in college, uh, when I was young and extremely inexperienced and more than a little bit naive. I started as a playtester in microprose. Uh, for a while, I was the only woman in the department. There were a few periods there when I was the only woman in all of development. I went from microprose to AOL. And I got to ride that whole dot-com roller coaster. If you notice those years, uh, when I started at AOL, it had 5 million members. And when I left, the service had close to 25 million members. And that was, of course, back before broadband and when we were all still enjoying the chatter of a modem. I went from AOL to Comcast right after Comcast had purchased AT&T broadband and ran the largest broadband service in the country. And then I left Comcast and joined 38 Studios, uh, which had a very sad and unfortunate demise earlier this year. Along the way, I was the IGDA chairperson. I was named to a few top women in games lists. And fundamentally, what I'd love for you to take away here is that there's no roadmap to get from playtester to CEO. There's no single way to do it, and you probably wouldn't want to do a lot of the things that I did anyway. What I think the most important point is, is that no matter where you are, you have to do what you love. Through all of these experiences, there was something that I loved. And when there wasn't, that was the best sign to me that it was time to move on. And that thing that you love might be a team, it might be a product, it might be a skill or a new challenge, but you have to find what you love every day. And that, in a, in a nutshell, is the very best career advice I can give you from 20 years in games. Now that said, over 20 years, you see a lot of changes. And if you are considering working in games, you have to embrace change. You have to be comfortable with knowing that how you develop a product today is not going to be how you develop a product in five years. The methodologies you use, the technology you use, the platforms you're developing for, they're all going to be very different. And if 20 years ago somebody had said, you know, when you think about PC gaming, the most important platform would arguably be the site called Facebook, uh, <laughs> I think they would have been thought more crazy than prescient. So you've got to understand that going into this, if you're looking at games as a long-term career, it's going to be a roller coaster. And if you can acknowledge that, and even more, if you can embrace it, then you're going to have a great career. If you can look for new opportunities to reach new audiences, to engage people, to get them connected, to help them have fun, that's really the key to understanding that change and to having that successful career. Now the other thing to think about working in games is that you're working in entertainment and services and products. And that means you will have deadlines that are non-negotiable. If you are working in live operations, 
for a massively multiplayer game, if that server goes down, it does not matter if it's your fifth anniversary or your birthday or your kid's birthday. You've got to fix it so that you don't have five million people calling customer support. And that can be a tough trade-off. And one of the things that you should think about is the trade-offs that you're willing to make. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a career in games, far from it. What it means is that you may want to have a different position or work for a different company or work in a different role. Somebody once said, you can have it all, you just can't have it all at once. And I think that that is a really important takeaway when you think about working in games. When I was the chairperson of the IGDA, I hosted a, a you know, studio heads on the hot seat panel, and I took a fair amount of flack for defending Mike Capps, who's the president of Epic Games, when he said that they expect all of their workers to work at, le at least 60 hours a week. And what I said to the IGDA membership is that, look, that's Epic's trade-off. If you work for Epic, you'll work at least 60 hours a week, and they make no bones about that. They are very, very clear about their expectations in terms of hours worked. You also get crazy big bonuses, and when you look at the parking lot of any of the Epic Studios, you see Ferraris and Lamborghinis and Mercedes and all sorts of cars that you very rarely see at a, a similar, similarly sized company. And that's a great example of a trade-off. For people who are willing to work 60 hours a week, Epic makes it worth their while, both in terms of financial compensation and, frankly, in terms of the quality of the games that they produce and some of the, you know, the idea that you get to work on one of the leading engines in the industry. On the other hand, there are companies out there, particularly indie companies in the mobile space, that deliberately set a high quality of life priority. And that means that you probably won't be bringing home a bonus that can buy you a Mercedes. But it means that if you say to your boss, you know what, tonight's my kid's birthday, so I have to leave at four, that your boss will be extremely understanding. There is no right or wrong answer to this. What is most important is that you understand what matters to you. And frankly, that's going to change over time as well. Your priorities when you're 24 are probably going to be different than your priorities when you're 34. And they will almost be certainly be different than the priorities you have when you're 44. Understand that, embrace it, and make the choice that's right for you at that time. Now, when you think about working in games, one thing to keep in mind is that love makes people do crazy stuff. And if you do your job well, people will love you or hate you. And they'll make that very personal. See, the thing is, we create stuff. We create art and experiences and stories. And when we do it well, we prompt emotions and feelings and engagement in a way that I think is like no other art form out there. You have to be prepared for when those emotions and feelings aren't what you want or expect. Understand that you are not your product. And while we'll talk a little bit more about this later, I want to share a piece of advice I got from a, a board member once. If saying it is going to make you feel really good, think long and hard before saying it. That's particularly true when you engage in discussions with community on the internet. Yeah, I guarantee that there is someone who is wrong on the internet. And the more you let that get to you personally, the more difficult it's going to be for you to maintain a healthy boundary and healthy respect. One of the challenges is that a lot of times people will attack you personally. They'll attack your appearance. They'll attack your morals. They'll attack your intelligence. They'll attack things that have absolutely nothing to do with your job or your game or your life. And that's one of the downsides of the, the amazing power of communication that we have thanks to platforms like Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus and forums. Um, if you look on the Women in Games, Game Dev listserv, uh, you'll hear 
don't read the comments um, repeated at least three times a week and there's a reason for that. That said, one thing that makes it easier for me anyway is knowing that when you get that kind of strong reaction it's because you prompted that deep emotion, you prompted that deep feeling and it's something that can be very gratifying if you understand that people respond because they care so much about the experience that you are trying to create. I get asked a fair amount about being a woman in games and while it's gotten a lot better over the last 20 years, it can still be very, very difficult. And it's not necessarily difficult simply because you're a woman. A lot of the experiences happen to people of all genders. Uh, they happen to any minority, whether you're a minority because of your gender, because of your race, because of your sexual orientation. Um, I'll share a, a, a funny story. I was meeting with a potential investor, uh, and you know, as the head of the company, and I'm dressed very professionally, covered from head to toe, and I come into the room and shake his hand and introduce myself, and he looks me up and down and says, wow, geeks sure have gotten sexier since I grew up. Now that's pretty horrifying. Um, he wasn't embarrassed, but I was for him. And it's one of those things that you know you, you have to understand in any industry, if you're going in as a minority of less than 20%, and that's, you know, that's the case across the entire industry and in many disciplines the ratio of men to women is much higher than 80-20. You're going to be treated differently. If you come in as a, someone who is transgender, LGBT, you'll probably be treated differently because you're a minority. If you come in as somebody who isn't Caucasian, you will likely be tr treated differently because you're a minority and it won't happen every day and it won't happen in every workplace and there are times when this can be a fantastic opportunity to educate other people but it's also going to be a challenge. I remember uh, coming in working way back in the, the late 90s um, on, the, on an EA.com AOL integration and coming into the team at EA and introducing myself and yeah, establishing that I actually really loved playing games. I'm talking about some of my experiences. I was lead tester on Civ 2. Uh, I'm a big board game player. And when I was talking to people, you could kind of see that eyes widen and this little smile starting because they realized I was one of them. I wasn't a token. I wasn't somebody who really ought to be working for a consumer packaged goods company somewhere. I was doing what I loved and I was doing it because I loved it because when I get a chance to save the world as my Jen Shepard um, it's amazing because I have been playing Civ 2 since 1995 and I still think it is one of the best games ever made and when you have that kind of love that kind of love that is obvious and transparent that does help you transcend the gender stereotypes. It helps you build those bridges. It helps you transcend racial stereotypes. And that's a great example of how you can flip the challenges of being a minority when you share that common passion. That said, common passion won't always get you out of, uh, out of difficulties. So I was named to a top 20 women in games list from Gama Sutra, very well uh, well respected and uh, a woman who I know and, and have a tremendous amount of respect for and who's very active in the women in game dev community wrote a blurb that she meant to be very complimentary and I remember when the article came out uh, my best friend called me up and said are you okay you know expecting me to be really angry at how I was described because I was described more as, for my looks than for any accomplishments or achievements. And it's funny, you know, because nobody says, hey, that Don Matrix really cute, or man, Bobby Kodak needs to lose some weight. This is a comment that seems to be um, really only directed towards women. And that's unfortunate. 
It's basic social psychology. Outliers get attention. And when you are a member of a 20% minority, you will get attention. The question that you have to answer for yourself is how you're going to use that attention. We will all, at some point in our life, find ourselves as a member of a minority group. And it might be based on gender, or it might be based on race. It might be based on sexual orientation. It might even be that you are the only Republican in a room full of Democrats. The question you have to answer your, for yourself is how you are going to use that attention. And again, when you can build those common bonds, when you can find that common passion, it's a great opportunity to open some eyes and to educate people that just because you're a little different doesn't mean that you don't have valuable ideas and valuable contributions to make. That just because you're a woman, the first thing that they shouldn't focus on is your looks. It's the contribution you can make to the conversation. Even more than uh, that last point, one of the things that I think is most important for us all to consider right now is how you can stand up for something that happens in the industry that you know is wrong. And we all have our different lines. Um, for some of us, you know, things are very black and white, and for others, the area is much more gray. But sooner or later, you will come across something that makes you say, this is wrong. And it might be overhearing a conversation um, that borders on harassment. It might be listening to a design decision that you feel exploits players. It might be being asked to work uncompensated overtime. It, there are, it might be um, being asked to make a statement that you don't feel is true. And no matter what, you have to have the courage of your convictions and act on them appropriately. First of all, don't blame yourself. If you find something that you think is wrong and you want to take a stand against it, it is not your fault. Don't blame the victim for feeling uncomfortable or feeling like this isn't the best way to run a business. Find people who support you. Have open, honest discussions um, about what's next. You know, have open and honest discussions about why this decision makes you feel uncomfortable. And ideally, you're working in a place where you can go and have that kind of respectful, constructive discussion with your peers and with your management team. And if not, that's when you lean on your trusted mentor and your network, and we'll get back to that uh, in a, a few slides. But having those people where you can say, hey, you know what, this decision made me feel really uncomfortable. What do you think about that? Am I missing something? How did you feel about it? That's something that is so important because sometimes, every now and then, there actually is a good reason for that decision that might have made you really uncomfortable. It could be that somebody made a comment that, you know, they simply didn't realize how it could be taken. Um, side note, uh, back when I was a playtester, we were testing a role-playing game called Dragon Sphere. And uh, I was testing it with Mick Yule, who is one of the sweetest men, kindest men, most gentle spirits I've ever met. And because we were all kind of crammed in this hallway, shoulder to shoulder, literally, Mick was sitting down on the other end of the hallway, and he yells out to me, hey, Jen, are you easy? And what he meant was, are you t playing on easy mode so I can test this next version on hard? But of course, you can imagine how a, you know, a group of about 20, 20 something guys took that when we were all stuffed in a hallway together. And context is actually very appropriate, or very, uh, very revealing there. But you know, and that's something where if I had gone to uh, my, my manager at the time, he probably and said, hey, that made me feel really uncomfortable. He probably would have sympathized and said, you know, do you think Mick meant anything by it? And I would have realized that being literally the gentlest soul on the planet, uh, he was 
way more embarrassed than I was and spent about the next 30 minutes apologizing. On the other hand, when you have the potential investor looking you up and down and saying, geeks sure have gotten sexier since I've grown up, uh, it's pretty darn obvious what they mean. And that's, you know, that's a time when you have to decide how exactly you're going to, to react to that. And if there is something that you think is fundamentally wrong, don't be afraid to take a stand. And again, I'll, I'll use an example of uh, my time as the IGDA chair. Uh, around that time, Mythic released uh, an MMO and did not include anyone other than current employees in the credits. And um, if any of you have ever even just played an MMO, much less worked on it, you know that that can, in many cases, be a 10-year undertaking. And for me, I feel passionately that if you work on a product, you deserve credit for it. Whether or not you are still an employee when that product ships or when that product gets a new revision, if you've worked on it, you did the work, you deserve the credit. And so I, I wrote an article about uh, fair crediting as the IGDA chair. And um, in general, got a lot of support from the game development community. The head of Mythic, uh, who I had known for quite some time because I was actually Mythic's product manager at AOL, which meant I was the person that made sure that they got promoted and got paid, um, called me absolutely furious. Uh, he also called my boss absolutely <laughs> furious. Um, and, you know, to, to give my boss credit at the time, he said, look, I read the article. I think Jen's absolutely right. I think you should change your credits. Didn't go over terribly well with Mark. But, you know, again, that's if you feel that strongly, then take that stand. And it might piss some people off. You might have the really nasty phone calls, the really nasty emails. But I can guarantee you, you will sleep way better knowing that you stood up for what you believe and you did it in a constructive and honest and respectful manner. You know, I'm not saying go off and spout and pick it and, and that kind of thing unless you feel like that's the only way you can get action. But if you stand up for what you believe in that respectful way, in that courageous way, in that way that is meant to encourage dialogue, you'll feel so much better than if you just kept your mouth shut because you were afraid to rock the boat. So one of the things, speaking of rocking the boat and picketing, uh, that we all need to keep in mind is owning our IP. These days, we have communication like nothing else in human history. And you can instantly share ideas with millions of people. And that can be amazing, and it can be horrible. Everything you do at work creates your professional brand. That includes how you dress, that includes how you act, and that includes what you say. And that carries over outside of work, too. You know, I have a, a Twitter account, um, and because of that, I don't post anything on that account that I wouldn't want shown to my grandchildren, shown to a potential employer, seen on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. That may make it, frankly, a less interesting Twitter account than it could be, but it's something that because there really is no privacy these days, you have to understand and you have to take into account. And, you know, I, I think um, the recent story in the United States of the director of the CIA resigning is a good one. You, know, you, can, you can argue about whether or not having an extramarital affair is reason for, for somebody to resign, but the fact is there is no privacy. Arguably, the director of the CIA should recognize that better than anybody else in the world. Um, and, you know, because of that, when you do something, uh, particularly as a more senior figure, as a more public figure, you have to understand that there will be repercussions. If you go back to the advice that I got from my board member, it would feel so good to say some things to some people. If you do that electronically, you need to expect it to be shared. And that's a really important point when you think about being a person in any industry. 
your IP, this culmination, the sum of everything that you do, of every communication that you make, is going to follow you for the rest of your life. Um, you know, another, uh, I'll share another example. I, I was Facebook friends with somebody I worked with, um, as was most of the company, uh, who posted about getting high that weekend. I don't care what you do in your weekend time. Could not have cared less whether or not he got high. But by posting it when he knew that HR was a friend of his, was a Facebook friend, he created some pretty interesting ethical dilemmas. You know, he was posting about a, a behavior that, right or wrong, was specifically forbidden in the employee handbook. And that's just dumb. So, you know, be careful. Think about your IP and your brand and your reputation and your image. What do you want to be known for? Do you want to be the cutting edge designer with an attitude? Do you want to be the artist who creates better character models than anybody else in the industry? Do you want to be the programmer who is the, the person that gets called when the game has to ship and there is this bug that they simply can't figure out? Understand what you want to be known for, what your IP is, and then ask yourself, is what I'm doing consistent with that IP? Is this something that I want the entire world to know? Is this a thought that I really feel strongly enough to share with everybody? And it's something, again, to be very cautious of and conscious of in the world that we live in. So I want to share some life lessons uh, getting back to those 20 years of doing, being fortunate enough and privileged enough to do something that I love. Uh, it doesn't mean that I've loved every minute of it. But what I've walked away knowing is that you need to treat everyone as you would want to be treated. But don't ever be a pushover. When I started out in my career, um, I was very fortunate in working for MicroPro Software. And I got to work with two absolutely brilliant designers. And as a 20-year-old, I learned so much from them in terms of how to treat people. So when uh, Sid Meier and Brian Reynolds were working on new games, and they did this both with, uh, colon with Civ Max, Colonization, Civ 2, um, they actively solicited feedback from people in the company that they trusted. And that just what wasn't just people in a specific discipline. They sent the, their games very early to playtest because they knew that the people in playtest generally played more games than anybody else in the company and uh, had a really good sense of what was fun and what wasn't. And that attitude that you can get valuable feedback on your product at every level from every person in the company was really striking to me especially when contrasted with the programmer who, after having a little bit too much to drink at a, a holiday party, you know, said loudly that trained monkeys could do the job of playtest. You can imagine who got uh, better attention uh, for their bugs. That's a, you know, that's a fantastic example of treating everyone as you would want to be treated. There is also a, a funny story I have from my time as a playtester. Uh, where I found this bug. We were, we were playtesting this game, Darklands, and when you beat a witch in combat, the text said you were supposed to receive four potions. And uh, you wouldn't always get four potions. And I kept submitting the bug, and it kept being uh, marked, not a bug, does not occur. I kept submitting it, and kept being pushed back, and finally, I got a reproducible save game, which, you know, as a playtester, makes you feel about as good as you can feel. And I took my, my uh, floppy disk, because that's, that was 20 years ago, down to the programmer's office and said, hey, I've got this you know, reproducible save from this bug. And he said, it doesn't happen. I'm not going to take a look at it. I said, no, really. I've got this reproducible save. And he said, I'm not going to waste my time. It doesn't happen. And I said, but I've got a reproducible save. You know, I'm not hallucinating. And the guy pulls up this code and says, Take a look at the code. It's so simple, even you should be able to understand it. Well, at this point, as you can imagine, I started getting a little bit upset. 
And uh, my boss was walking by and heard some raised voices. After sending me out to cool down a little bit, he finally got the programmer to take a look at the bug. And long story short, the programmer, in spite of working with code that was so simple that even a playtester could understand it, couldn't fix the problem and ended up having to change the text from you get four potions to you get some potions because he had no idea what was going wrong. And that, to me, you know, always stuck with me whenever I would have a discussion with somebody who was saying, hey, there's a problem, especially if it was a problem that I didn't want to hear about. No matter who they were, no matter what they came in to talk about, as long as it was a constructive and respectful dialogue, as long as it was honest, they deserve my full attention. They deserve my full consideration. And again, if it's something that you don't want to hear, it's easy to pull up the code and say, this doesn't happen. Look, even you can understand this isn't really a problem. But a lot of times, people are right. And it's more that you don't want to hear about the problem that you know deep down might be there. One of the other things that I hope you all keep in mind is that sometimes the hardest feedback to hear is the most valuable. Um, there was a time when I, I called a board member absolutely furious at how a meeting had gone expecting her to sympathize completely with me. And instead, she pretty much gave me the most effective dressing down I've ever received in my career, uh, where she pointed out very succinctly and very bluntly exactly how I had screwed that meeting up, um, how ill-prepared I was, how I let it get out of control, how I got over-emotional. And I remember after that conversation kind of taking a deep breath and first of all saying, ouch, man, ow. And then saying, wow, I am 100 times better now because I heard that really, really tough feedback than I would have been if I hadn't received it. So just as when somebody brings problems to you that you may not want to hear, you know, when somebody gives you feedback that you may not want to hear, that's usually a good sign that you need to pay closer attention to it than anything else. So Luke had uh, messaged me on Twitter to make sure I was ready to go, and I responded by saying, yep, just got Puppy and the two kids out of the way so I can focus without too much distraction. And when you talk about a team, one of the things that I, I want everyone to understand is you can't do this alone. You need to find the people around you who make you stronger, who make you better. Find mentors at work. Develop those relationships. There's a lot that goes into being a good mentee. And it's, there's, you know, you can Google it and pick up some basic uh, suggestions. But finding somebody who's more experienced who can help you in your career is going to be such an asset. And it's not just professionally. You know, what's your support system around you? Who can help you be more effective? And maybe it's the husband who takes the two kids and the puppy out so that you can give a talk without distractions and interruptions. Maybe it's the best friend that you know you can call and vent to. Maybe it's the peer at work who will actually sit you down and say, look, what you did in that meeting, that was bullshit. And here's why. And here are the, the repercussions. And maybe it's the mentor who gives you a dressing down when you need it to make you better. That kind of support system is absolutely critical now more than ever because the industry has changed and is changing so much that you simply can't go it alone. And having those people, and it might be the, the friend you can call when you've had a terrible day and you need somebody who um, can give you some uplifting and positive uh, feedback. It might be the, the marketing genius who you worked with two jobs ago that can uh, give you honest feedback about the product that you're considering. 
it might be the fantastic programmer down the hall who will give you really good feedback at exactly the, uh, how strange the design uh, you know, system you want to put in for an RPG is. All of those people make you better. And that's really the heart of a team. The other thing to keep in mind is that, again, what you need now to be better and to be stronger is not what you're going to need in 10 years. And it's not what you're going to need in 20 years. And that's OK. That's natural. Understanding why sometimes you may have outgrown a relationship, understanding why sometimes uh, the marketing guy from two jobs ago might be great for some kind of product, but for the direction that you're going in in your career, he's not necessarily the best fit. That's OK. It doesn't mean you stop talking to him. It doesn't mean he falls off the face of the earth. It just means he has a different role in your team. And that is something that we all need to understand. As our life changes, as our goals change, as our priorities change, our support team changes too. Sometimes I'd want to take Liara on a mission. Sometimes I'd want to take Thane. Both are equally valid choices. I hope that you've heard a consistent theme running through this talk. Everything you do, anything you do, will be better if you can find something you love about what you're doing. It will be easier for you to wake up excited it will be easier for you to get through the really tough times because I can guarantee that over 20 years you will have some really terrible times. It would be great if you didn't, but I don't think there's anybody that I've ever met that has had 20 consistent years of only positive happiness and fantasticness. That's just not the way life is. And if you can hold on to what you love, and again, that's going to change. Sometimes you will go through hell because you're with a team that you love. And the product doesn't really even matter as long as you get to work with this team. Sometimes you will be so passionate about a product that the team doesn't matter as much because you know this product is what you've dreamed of doing. Sometimes It'll be getting a chance to learn this new skill, to do something that you've never done before, and to be so fired up about that challenge that that makes the other things a lot less important. All of those things are great. And as long as you can find that something that you love, it's going to be worth it. And if you can't find that something you love, then you need to take a good, hard look at what you're doing and ask yourself, is this only a temporary burnout? Is it kind of a, the uh, analogy of a seven-year itch? Or is it really time for a change? And if it's time for a change, if you truly don't love, if you can't find anything to love about what you're doing, then understand it, embrace it, and love the change. So that's, uh, that's my talk. I hope you guys have found it useful and I'm looking forward to hearing any questions that you might have. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, it's the last session of the day so I've actually been able to sit and listen to that. Um, okay, so we have got some questions coming in. Um, so there's a, a group of uh, developers down in Southampton, uh, development students, they've got together all in one room to sit and listen. Uh, so a quick shout out to them because they've been sending in questions all weekend. Uh, and oh, we've got great. another one here. Uh, what has surprised you most about your journey? And where have your expectations been most different from what has actually happened? Uh, what has surprised me most um, was how much I loved so much of what I was doing. Uh, a little bit of, of personal history. I'm the first person in my family to finish college. I'm the first person in my family to go to graduate school. And so growing up, just the thought that I would go to college was kind of a big deal. You know? and, and my dad is an amazing guy who works for the post office. And um, my mom uh, worked at, and had to retire early because of health issues. So the idea that I could wake up and for so much of my career be really, really excited uh, about what was going on 
um, and what I was about to go in and do and the people that I was doing it with was a real gift. And, you know, as I kind of think about what I want to do next in my career, I, I have two criteria and they are non-negotiable. First is working with people that I trust and respect and like. And second is working on a product that I can feel truly passionate about. And if I can say yes to those two things, I don't really care about what the position is. I don't really care about what the title is. I don't even care all that much about the salary, although I do you know, kind of need to, to eat. Um, because none of those things, not a fancy title or, or a fancy office or, or a prestige company or salary, none of those things matter if you can't stand the people that you're working with and can't stand what you're doing. Um, and then second half of the question, uh, Actually, Luke, I'm sorry, could you repeat the second half of the question? I got a little too verbose there. No, absolutely. Um, where have your expectations been most different from what actually happened? Uh, you know, that's, that's a great question. Um, I've had to deliberately stay away from 38 Studios in this talk uh, because of the ongoing litigation with the, the end of the company. Um, but I would say, you know, probably when I joined 38 Studios in 2008, I was really caught by the vision of having an, an IP that people could interact with across multiple platforms and having those experiences tied together. And Reckoning was really the first step in that. Um, and, you know, it was, it was very sad and very painful for a lot of people to see it end the way that it did. And I, I would say, you know, the, the ending of 38 Studios and the unfulfilled promise that so many people, so many fantastic, amazing people on that team had bought into um, was by far the most difficult thing I've experienced in my career. Okay, uh, we've got another question from Derek. Uh, I'm in a small development team with seven guys and two women. The women are in art and narrative since they don't have the training for the other areas. Um, what are some ways that I can incorporate them without making gender an issue? That's a fantastic question. Um, and one of the things, you know, you've got a great opportunity because you work on such a small team. You know, with seven people, uh, there are a lot of ways that you can pull both art and narrative into some pretty basic discussions. So, for example, around tools creation. Um, one of the things that I learned from the team at Big Huge Games was that uh, they considered programming a, a service group. And so they would go out and speak to kind of their internal customers. And just by pulling art and narrative into things like technical discuss, uh, discussions around tool creation or you know, looking at potential systems in the kind of game that you're creating, you almost make gender irrelevant because you want to create this fantastic product and you want to do it in a way that allows every uh, every group to, to participate and every person to participate. So, you know, I think there it gets back to finding that common passion. You know, presumably everybody's there because they care about what they're doing and because they want to build a really, really great game. So think about how you can bring everyone into the discussion, even if it's not an immediate and obvious fit. You know, if you are a systems designer talk to narrative about the story that they're trying to tell and how systems work into that. If you're a programmer and you're working on tools, even if they aren't immediately, you know, it wouldn't be obvious that art would be an internal customer, go ahead and talk to the artist about what kind of tools they've worked with in the past, what they like, what they don't like. Even if you're doing audio tools, get that kind of feedback. Because the more you emphasize that common ground, the more you create that common goal, the less relevant the differences are, whether that difference is gender or discipline or anything else that you can think of. So John asks, was there any point where you felt like your career wasn't moving in the right direction or fast enough? You know, <laughs> it's funny, John, I've, I've kind of considered my career to be this huge, amazing blessing. Um, 
you know, along the way, when I was at AOL for a time, uh, it was a, it had become a very status conscious organization. And so if you wanted to get past a certain level, um, unless you were an old timer, you, you needed an MBA and it needed to be an MBA from a, a top tier school. So I decided I'd go back to business school or go back to school and go to business school. And even though I ended up regretting some of um, my more relaxed semesters as an undergrad, I ended up being admitted to both some, some great full-time programs and some great executive programs. And of course, right at that time, the AOL Time Warner merger happened and I thought, how could I possibly leave the biggest merger in media history to go back to school? And I ended up going to an executive program that was very good. Um, but you know, when I think about it, it wasn't necessarily because I was frustrated with the pace of my career. I think it, it was more that I had kind of lost that love and that passion and I was looking for something to reignite it. And it happened to be uh, this graduate school program where I got to alternate between one week, in, uh, one week a month in New York and one week a month in London with 64 of the most intelligent people that I've ever met. Um, and that would get me really excited about taking the ideas that I learned at school back to work. And I don't think it was, again, looking back, I would have told you it was because I wanted to break through that ceiling and have that top tier MBA. But in the end, I think it was because I, I had kind of lost that passion and I needed a kick in the pants to get it back. Um, in general, I've been really blessed in my career and, and I'm really grateful for the opportunities that I've had. Uh, but that's also, I think, one of those things where you have to be willing to step up and take advantage of those opportunities and do some of the hard work and most importantly, find that passion. Because that's one thing that you can't fake. And when you try, people know it and they'll call bullshit on you. Uh, Jay in Chicago says, uh, coming back to your advice to sort of embrace change, do you think that this allows individuals to become more adaptable in more broader social and interpersonal situations in the industry, depending on their role? Absolutely. Uh, you know, that's, that's a very astute question because it really picks up on the way the industry is changing. And you're starting to see fewer and fewer large teams and more, you know, seven, nine person teams. Um, and that really forces people to develop new skills. And I think that that is actually fantastic. Um, the most, for me anyway, what I find is the most frustrating thing is to feel like I'm not learning anything new. Um, and you don't necessarily have to take on an entirely new role. You could just work with somebody who is fantastic at what they're doing and, and teaches you a lot about what they know. Um, but you've got to have that adaptability. And if you're really stuck in only working on AAA console games that have a minimum budget of $40 million and are done using agile development methodology in this specific manner, I think you're going to have a really tough time making an ongoing career out of game development because so much is changing and the way we make games is changing. What we think of a game is changing. What we play games on is changing. That that adaptability has to be there in order for you to really sustain yourself over more than two or three or four years. The good news is that it opens up so many more doors you know, when you think about some of the, the things that you're starting to see in the industry, and I was talking with a friend of mine, Dave Ettery, who's the CEO of SpryFox. Um, they do Triple Town. And uh, Dave is one of the smartest guys in the games industry, um, and they do a distributed team. So they have team members all over the world. And when you think about that model and the opportunities that that model affords, it is amazing being able to live where you want instead of having to move every three to five years for a job. Wow, that's so liberating and fantastic. You know, being able to choose whether or not you want to take a project where you're working with a 10 person team or a 150 person team, that's really cool. 
and having that kind of adaptability and developing those skill sets so that you will be equally valuable to that 10 person team or that 150 person team. That's something that's absolutely key. Understanding how to work with people remotely, understanding how to embrace that change, how to take on new roles, how to learn new technologies, because learning is in itself a skill. Those are all really important things to work on as you think about where the industry is going. So staying with the theme of, of learning for a second, obviously you've got your MBA and that kind of is relevant for, for you more than anything. I mean, MBAs are pretty standard no matter where you are in business. But Adam asks, do you think that getting a master's in game design is worth it? I think, Adam, it depends on what you want to do. Um, and, you know, I've actually only worked with two other MBAs uh, in my game development career. <laughs> um, both were incredibly smart, uh, but I didn't necessarily think more of them because of a piece of paper. And for me, what I took away from my graduate school experience was a lot more uh, focus and commitment and, um, frankly, the network than a specific skill or specific data point. Part of it was that I was going to school full time while I was working full time, which is slightly insane and requires a lot of dedication and focus and commitment. Um, but, you know, it was. If you, if you feel strongly, if you really believe that a master in game development is worth it, then I think you should ask yourself why. Um, will it give you the confidence you need to assert yourself more or to apply for jobs that um, you might not feel comfortable applying for now? If the answer is yes, then it might be worth it, no matter what you learn in the actual classes. Will it give you the hands-on practical experience that is so critical for breaking into the industry and that you can't get right now for whatever reason? If yes, then maybe it's worth it. Um, if you can go out and do a game jam and you have a really active local indie community and you've got a lot of other opportunities and you feel confident in your skills, then maybe it's not worth it for you. So I think it's a really individual question. Nobody's going to say, oh no, he's got a master's degree in game development. How terrible. Uh, but I think some people need it more than others just for maybe that structure and that motivation and um, that kind of, of help and approach. Yeah, it's, it's a very individual question. Okay, so it looks like we've got one more, which just about fits in with the time, so that's pretty useful. Um, the guys down in Southampton again, uh, what one specific piece of more practical advice would you give to students looking to go into the industry? That's, so that's, a, that's sort of putting you on the spot a bit there. <laughs> no, I think that's a great question, and that's a, a great wrap-up. Um, play as many games as you possibly can. Think critically about those games. Think about what makes them good, what makes them bad. Be prepared to talk critically about those games. And then apply the lessons that you learn from those games to making your own. You know, when we would look at people uh, coming in for entry level positions, the most important thing, the thing that always jumped out, was actual practical hands on experience. And you can get that with a mod. You can get that with Unity. There are so many options these days to um, help you get that practical hands-on experience. And if you can combine that with being able to think critically about what you've done and talk critically about it, if, for example, say you mod a level for um, Skyrim and come in and talk about why you made the choices you did, compare it to other levels that game designers had done, talk about what works, talk about what doesn't work, and show that you can think critically and accept good feedback, and that you can just use the tools and do the job, that will make you stand so far above the other competitors for that job that um, that's really the best way to break into the industry, bar none. 
Awesome. Thank you very much, Jen. That's a fantastic keynote. Um, so, uh, well, on behalf of everyone, I, I think I can't imagine there's anybody listening who hasn't taken something away from that. So thank you very much. I um, hope so. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's really been an honor and a pleasure. Well, we feel the same about having you, so it all works out. Um, so I don't know if you want to head off or not, but I've got two pages of notes here. The last session, so now we get to do all the thank yous and stuff. Um, <laughs> at, at a minimum, I'm going to mute you guys, so thanks again. Okay, bye. Um, okay, so... Um, Why can't I hear what you're saying? So, uh, yeah, I put him on mute. Yeah. Um, Heather's headed off, uh, unfortunately. She's not here for the end, so I can say whatever I want. Um, but I probably shouldn't, because she will watch it later. So, uh, but on behalf of both of us, uh, we'd like to thank, uh, we'd like to thank Ian, Ian Schreiber, who gave the opening keynote, and of course, Jen McLean, who you've just seen give the closing keynote. Uh, absolutely excellent speakers. We, we couldn't have done better with them. Um, we had the panel yesterday. Uh, we had uh, awesome panelists on that, uh, taking the time to share their experiences of, of them getting into the industry re and recently, and that's stuff that you can sort of take forward and put into your own career development just now, and we really hope that that's been useful for you. Um, we had the first uh, episode of the Student Showcase yesterday, the second one today. Um, this is the first time that we've run this, and... Um, we were completely unsure how it was going to go in the end. Um, and even when we started up with the idea, we didn't know we were going to get enough students uh, proposing, or, or sorry, submitting their projects. Um, and it, it turned out that we did. Um, so it couldn't have happened without the judges. Uh, so thank you to, to the eight judges that came along, gave up their time to critique uh, the, uh, the, the projects. We also, I mean, it really couldn't have happened without the entrance. Um, it's a really tough proposition to put yourself forward, to get up and in front of the world and four experts talk about what you're doing and try to pitch why it's amazing. Um, my biggest regret with the student showcase is really that we couldn't put everybody up. We've only got time for six panelists. Uh, we had about 30 submitted. And we had to cull quite hard, and there were some amazing people who didn't make the cut. Um, so moving on from the student showcase, we couldn't put a conference on without content. And a really huge amount of thanks is due to our speakers. Um, some of them are old hands at speaking. Some of them are uh, brand new, and we've had to talk them into speaking. Um, but thank you to everybody who took the time to create the sessions. I mean, creating these sessions takes quite a lot of work. Um, so we couldn't have done this whole event without these people. We wouldn't have had anything to show you all weekend. Um, behind the scenes, I'd like to thank uh, Lindsay Moulds. She's been, uh, so there's been me and Heather sort of running things, but Lindsay's also been helping out covering sessions for us here and again through the weekend. Um, that's been really important so we don't lose our minds. I've been able to slip away and have a bit of food. Uh, I think Heather has as well. Uh, so a big thank you to Lindsay. And finally, thank you to you, um, to the audience. We put this whole thing together because we kind of thought that there was a bit of a need for something like this or we could see that it might be a benefit and we really hope it was. Um, and we're going to collate all the videos, we're going to put them up online. Uh, I think they are already. Uh, some of them are on my account, some of them are on Heather's account. We're going to bring them all together, put them in one place for you so you can find them very easily. And we want to create something that's going to be of lasting benefit and a lasting testament to the effort that we've all put in to make this weekend happen. Um, and finally, I don't know if the last thing was finally as well, but this one is finally, finally. If you're still watching live, if you're watching uh, on the embedded page, just above this video, there's a link for feedback. Please, please click this link. Go in, rate the sessions, tell us what you like, tell us what you didn't like. For a start, it helps us to gauge what we should be uh, covering more of and doing more with next time. 
It also allows us to give feedback back to the speakers and tell them how their sessions went. Uh, without that, we can't do that. We all can't improve. Um, so thank you again for coming. Thank you to everybody involved. And we will see you for the next Alt Dev Conf, which uh, the next student one, we don't know. The next real one, we're thinking probably May. Um, so Alt Dev Conf Prime will be back May. Stay tuned to Alt Dev Blogger Day and the Alt Dev Conf Twitter feed. Thank you and good night.